Welcome back to the Globetrotters podcast, where we feature the travel stories of real, everyday people in the hopes that we may inspire others to look beyond their borders, literally and figuratively. My name is Jonathan Otero, and I'm pleased to welcome you back on the next leg of our journey, along with my two co-hosts. I'm Saskia Hatvani. And I'm Maximil Gonzalez. And if you missed our last episode, it featured Natalie Oganesian, a young solo female traveler who embarked on a marathon hiking trip across Western United States. In episode six, Natalie traveled to 10 national parks, adopted a stray cat while on the road, and nearly escaped a fast moving wildfire. Um, if you guys didn't catch that, yes, Natalie adopted a cat while on the road. Mind you, she was already traveling with her husky. I was I was more impressed that she was actually walking her cat while on these hikes. So she bought a I harness know. for it. It's crazy. I mean, no, respect, Natalie, respect. <laughs> But on today's episode, we talk to Shondor Hatvani, and if you don't recognize that name, well, you should because he's my younger brother. Shondor and I talk about his experience getting his very first job on a dairy farm in Australia, which is hilarious for several reasons, especially if you know him. Like many 18-year-olds, Shondor was just figuring life out, and he just happened to be doing it while thousands of miles away from home, <laughs> which makes for a pretty entertaining story if you ask me. Hey, Shondor, how are you? Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm good, yeah. Here uh, talking to you from uh, the UK, Brighton. So first of all, we need to talk about why you even decided to go to Australia in the first place. So what made you want to go there um, fresh out of high school? Yeah, fresh out of high school. A lot of people were doing it and a lot of people were coming back with some cool experiences. And I was like, well, I want that too. Uh, you know, once you graduate from high school, if you're taking a gap year, you need to find a way to make money. And uh, Australia at the time, at least, it was um, relatively easy for somebody with not that much experience, i.e. an 18-year-old, to go out mm -hmm. to Australia and to find a job that would, uh, wouldn't be a good job, but it would pay, it would pay well um, as, far as, um, as far as European standards. Yeah, and you mentioned a few key things here, which is that it's called a working holiday visa, and we'll, we'll get into it mm -hmm. a little bit later. Essentially, it's, it's what it sounds like. It's a working holiday visa. So you get a year, and you're able to live and work in Australia if you want. I mean, you don't have to work um, during that time. You can just travel if you want. You went with someone else, right? A friend of yours? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, this is a funny story. So before going to Australia there, I decided, okay, I'm going to go to Australia. But before that, I'm going to spend uh, a month in France, trying to you know, see my friends, visit my grandparents. And uh, so when I got there, I went to see my friend Jan, who I'm now living with. And uh, I met a friend of his who had uh, graduated high school the same, same year as us. And uh, he was uh, unsure what he wanted to do. He was unemployed. He was struggling to find a job and he had a uh, hunger for travel. Uh, mm -hmm. He only spoke French, which I knew from the start that was going to be a bit, of, a bit of a tricky thing. We got to know each other over about a week. And then he was like, oh, I'd love to come with you. And I was like, yes, you know, secretly hoping that you would say that because I was afraid of going alone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a terrifying prospect. So, you know, I went to Australia mm -hmm. as a team with a guy that I knew for like two weeks. Um, so you can imagine, <laughs> you know, there might be some problems down the road. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I went with my boyfriend of two years and there were problems. Yeah, so yeah. Really, it's just an example of like how you learn very quickly whether or not you can stand the other person you're <laughs> yeah, traveling that's so with or true. not. You yeah, know what I mean? Like I realize, it really accelerates yeah. relationships. Oh, it does. It does for sure. It does for sure. And, uh, you know, he made it apparent to me that um, he didn't have that much money in savings and it would be a bit of a struggle for him. And uh, I, you know, made him aware, like, you know, it's okay, like, I can lend you a bit of money, etc. You know, if we're having mm -hmm. a hard time, not really uh, expecting uh -oh. how much of a hard time we would actually have. So we landed, uh, we landed in Sydney, everything was good. You know, we, we got into this party hostel, and we were like, having a great time drinking goon and all this stuff. And it was Okay, first of all, you're, you're gonna have to explain, we're gonna have to explain what a hostel is and what goon is. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, but, uh, but a hostel is basically, for those who don't know, it's, it's like a kind of very cheap place to stay and it attracts a lot of young people and backpackers and they exist all over the world. Um, and oh, yeah. do you wanna explain and goon. what goon is? <laughs> the nastiest wine you could ever have. Um, it was really <laughs> nasty. It's, it's really so bad. basically goon. So goon always comes in a box. It's basically really cheap 
box wine. I mean, coming from like France, where you can get a decent bottle of wine for like three bucks. Yeah. Um, in Australia, you know, every bottle of wine is over ten dollars. You know, cigarettes are like twenty dollars. Hard liquor is like in the fifties or sixty dollars, I think. So like a lot of people are trying to have a good time when they're backpacking. They're trying to party. They're trying to meet people, and so there's a lot of goon. Uh, floating around and um, oh, I heard yeah. that goon was goon the word was a de derogatory term to it was derogatory towards the aborigines and I'd always heard that it was a bit like it wasn't it's not a word that you should use really because in some way it's derogatory but I never knew how it was derogatory so maybe it's yeah a and I'm gonna insert a little clip if we uh, figure out what the real true meaning of it but just so you know it could be an offensive word do you, did you, uh, did it mess up your stomach at any point? Like, cause I think I got some permanent damage. I destroyed my stomach. <laughs> yeah. I have a worse story that I'll never tell in public because oh, yeah. <laughs> it's just horrible. <laughs> so <laughs> you can let your imagination run wild. Um, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. Right. <laughs> you were saying. You'll, you'll tell me in secret. You'll tell me off the air. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you in secret. I'll, I'll off know. Off record. So yeah, you're in Sydney. Yeah, uh, you're yeah. I'm partying in like a back, like a true backpacker. You're running out of money. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Running out of money. But yeah, but just like I think after like week two, he ran out of money. So I was uh, spotting him cash. Uh, I was looking for jobs in the area, and uh, there were construction jobs in Sydney. But I knew that you know if I would get a construction job, I might get stuck in the city, which is not what I wanted because I wanted to be in the outback. In Sydney, there is just too many places to spend. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for farm jobs in the area and I found something out that I wish I knew before, but it was not fruit picking season in the Sydney area. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. In fact, it wasn't the fruit picking season in any place close to where I was. And so uh, I was on Gumtree, which is kind of like the Craigslist of Australia. Yeah, <laughs> totally it is. And uh, I found an ad for tractor drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, well, a tractor driver. Mm -hmm. Uh, on a dairy farm. While we were talking over the phone, I could barely understand what this person was saying. I mean, he had a thick accent. The connection was terrible because he was in the outback. I think the it was uh, 500 uh, Australian dollars a week. And I asked him, look, we're, we're two people. We both want 500 a week each. He said, mm -hmm. okay. Now the connection was really bad and I couldn't really, and then he said some more stuff and I couldn't really make out, make it out. But at that point I was, I needed a job so much that I was willing to neglect, you know, uh, some of the uh, fuzzy <laughs> areas, some of the red flags yeah. that came up. And so I was in Sydney. He was in Victoria. So that's far ways away. I had to get a plane mm -hmm. ticket to Melbourne. And I got a ticket and that was like the last of our money. So then uh, a few days later, we flew out. The farmer came to pick us up. And uh, it's funny. He's a young chap. I think he's like mm -hmm. uh, 30s, early 30s. Uh, he's kind of disheveled, like very messy hairdo kind of all over the place. Uh, there was like three cups of empty takeaway coffee in his car. And, you know, <laughs> the guy was like super right. wide on coffee. <laughs> and he was talking loads. <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was, I was, I was afraid because I was like, who is this person? Yeah, I'm getting this person's car. We're going to drive for eight hours. going to take me to a place that I've never been to. Eight hours? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. For eight, eight hours. hours. Okay. So this is a perfect this is the perfect time to explain to people like, you know, when you look on the map and you see Australia as like this cute little island looking thing. Well, that place is massive. Cute. It is so big. I, in fact, and I've looked this up many times, so it's I know it US. off the top of my head, but it's two thirds the size of the U.S. Okay. But there's only 25 million people live there. In the U.S., there's 200, uh, sorry, 350 million people. So just imagine in Australia how far you have to drive between places, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, we drove eight hours to Cobram, which is a small town. And, uh, you know, along the ride during that uh, eight-hour journey, I work up the courage to... Uh, talk about our, um, you know, arrangement, mm -hmm. our employment arrangement. Wait, what was his name? Uh, I can't, I can't remember his name. Man. Damn. Yeah. Can we give him a name? Um, well, what, what, what did he look like? Uh, he looked like a gym. A gym? <laughs> we call right. him Jim. So Jim, <laughs> what, what did he say? <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, so, you, you know, just to be clear, you, we both get 500 a week for working five 
days a week. We didn't even clarify the hours. This is how bad I was at making arrangements. And uh, he was like, uh, no, 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 you don't get paid 500 each. It's 500 for both <laughs> for one week. So, you know, we're expected to split the 500. So that's 250 each for a week, which is not, is not enough. It's not enough no at way. all. Yeah, that's like 200 American dollars. Yeah, it's nothing for a week's work. Yeah, and, you know, just doing, pretty much just doing that because, you know, when we're mm. not working, we're not doing anything else. There's no Wi-Fi. There's no, <laughs> there's no 3G or anything. So you're just sitting there, you know, <laughs> reading the only book you can fit in your backpack. And then Baptiste in the back starts losing his shit and starts talking in French, cussing in <laughs> French and stuff, that like me and stuff. And I'm like, dude, like trying to talk to him in French. And Jim was like... um, uh, what is your what is your what is your friend saying? Is he upset? And I was like, no, he's not upset. And you know, so I was trying to I was trying to mediate between the two, not really knowing what was going on myself. I ended up uh, talking about just saying like, uh, look, uh, yeah, you know, we're being screwed, but let's 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 just stay at least for a week or two, and then try to find a job elsewhere during uh, the time being. He was like, all right, let's do that. Uh, so yeah, we continued the journey, and we got to uh, the farm. And uh, just before he brought us to our accommodation, he took us to the tractor that we were going to be working in. Um, and so we checked out the tractor for the first time. And it was a 1980s Ford tractor with the with the back window completely blown out because <laughs> it like uh, this is a, the tilling equipment hit a rock and flung it. The <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Treacherous. Yeah. Which, you know, didn't really make us feel great about ourselves because we were like, well, you know, <laughs> what happened to the person sitting there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so then after that, after checking out the tractor, he brought us to uh, our accommodation. And so originally we were staying in the house on in the house on the farm. Mm -hmm. And so we stayed there for two days. And then he was like, oh, we're, we're going to move you to uh, I'm going to move you to another another place. And so we're like, OK, cool. And he moves us to this house with no fridge, no hot water. There was no stove. There was nothing. And he expected us to live there for a month. And we were telling the guy, like, this is not livable. You know, we yeah. can't even store food. We don't have yeah. a vehicle to go buy food. You know, it's like, it's ridiculous. Totally. You know, yeah. how's somebody yeah. supposed to, you know, this is crazy. No, you know, no hot water. You know, it's <laughs> it bad. Yeah. And actually, yeah, actually, before going to see the tractor and before he took us to our first place, he brought us to where he lived to pick something up. And he lived in absolute squalor oh really take away on the ground all over the place Ugh, gross. spider webs lot like just covering the ceiling we're not even talking about in corners we're talking about covering the ceiling oh my god the carpet floor full of mud like it was <laughs> oh, and shit. he was trying to run a business Dude. from there and no. so we were, I was just, I was feeling so bad about all no. this. I was like, you're so yep. fucked. No, what have thanks. I done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And, you know, driving the tractor was a whole experience as well. You know, we were put in this tractor to basically uh, turn the soil in the fields. Right. And we were giving tilling equipment. So it's just like mod this trailer that you pull behind the tractor. He instructed us to do the tilling extremely fast. He was like, Okay, I'm going to ask you to do this particularly fast. I'm going to show you how to do it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but I want you to do it, right. you know, do it as fast as possible. And so we were going, you know, he got me in the tractor and we were going like ridiculously fast down the field. And at the end of the field, when you're supposed to turn, come back up and do another row parallel mm -hmm. to the row that you had previously done, right? You kind of go down and sweep back up right. and go down and that sort of pattern, you know. Just keep zigzagging down the field. That turn was always very tedious because he wanted us to do it very fast, you know. And so mm -hmm, you're basically mm -hmm. like drifting a tractor uh, around the bends. You know, it was like there was understeer <laughs> and then at the end there was like wheel swing at the back. I mean, it was great. Tracer <laughs> checked it wasn't supposed to do that, you know. And the right. tilling equipment was flying through. Right? I mean, it was nuts. And, um, and so once when I was uh, doing that maneuver at high speeds, I was doing it at the, uh, I was doing the last row and the last row of the field is up against the fence. I could see my friend Baptiste at the other end who was waiting to, uh, you know, pick up his shift from me. Um, I could see him at the end of the field just waving his arms frantically. And I was like, you know, thinking like, what the hell is he? Why is he so animated? You know, I was at the end of my shift. I was exhausted. I turned around and I saw the damage and I immediately stopped. Part of the wire fence was raveling up into the till equipment and ripping down the whole rest of the fence. 
and uh, <laughs> like post by post, post by just... post, yeah, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and proceeded to spend the next two three hours picking out the metal wire from the bloody tilting equipment, <laughs> <laughs> unpaid. <laughs> dude, he was he was probably pissed, dude. The farmer guy. Yeah, he was, but was he pissed? What do you expect at the same time? I mean, I, I mean, yeah, we didn't do the job properly, but he wasn't even paying us or hosting us. Yeah, properly yeah, totally. And and I want to I want to interject here and just say that like because Chandra's not making this uh, working in Australia thing sound very appealing. Yeah. Um, this is just like <laughs> one experience that someone's had, and and for, um, I had a totally different experience. So like, we ended up getting a strawberry picking job, which was. I mean, it's a story for another time, um, but it, it let's just say it wasn't ideal, but it definitely wasn't like um, as bad as getting 200 bucks a week <laughs> 250, um, 250. and staying in, you know, like our, our cabin was pretty shitty and um, our bosses were questionable and it was a really painful job to do, but you know, we ended up getting like an apple farm job and stuff afterwards, you know. And also, you know, I met tons of people who, um, instead of doing farm work, they uh, decided to work in restaurants in like a beach town. Or um, I have a friend who worked on a charter sailing boats. And so, you know, there's just a lot of ways to go about this. Oh, but yeah. um, anyway, so Shondor, how long do you stay at this job? <laughs> like, how do you get out of it? Okay, yeah, so I think we stayed no longer than five days. Um, That's it? And all that shit happened in five days? <laughs> yeah, yeah, all, yeah, a bunch of shit happened in five days. I mean, most of it basically us being terrible at our job. <laughs> On that fifth day, I confronted him and I was like, okay, you need to pay us more. And uh, also ask him for better accommodation because where he was putting us was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said, no, you know, uh, you know, right. you, can, you can leave. Um, he was fine. like, you have no bargaining chips. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Get out of here. Yeah. yeah. So uh, he dropped us off in Cobram and we find out, found out that uh, there was no place to stay really in Cobram. Uh, we found this uh, closest kind of like small city called Shepperton, not knowing what Shepperton was like at all. Uh, we realized that uh, Shepperton was actually quite dodgy. Yeah. And absolutely ravaged by meth. Oh, really? Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, we spent like uh, a week there. And then after a while, we found uh, a fruit picking job mm -hmm. um, with a farmer. Little did we know that it wasn't actually the farmer that was going to employ us, but uh, a lady that was running this sort of hustle where she would uh, rent out these makeshift rooms that she had in her house to backpackers oh, okay. and find work for them. Okay. Uh, in uh, local farms. So she'd like pimp and, out backpackers, uh, basically. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. She was a backpacker pimp. And her name was No Lean. <laughs> I've met some hostile owners like that. And it's more, it's a little more, how would you say, official feeling because it's like a, a hostel. People come to work and then they'll, yeah. they'll contact farmers. And then um, it's a little sketchier when it's just some random lady like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Renting rooms of her house. Yeah, in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and also in the middle of an alpaca farm. She also owned an alpaca farm where she bred alpacas. Oh my god. Yeah, which is it was so nutty, the whole situation was funny. So Nolene, she was uh, quite a special lady. She picked me up and she was, you know, kinda lively. She was having a good morning. And uh, you know, I kinda was like, Oh, she's an interesting type, you know. Uh, like uh, a few red flags like she looks a bit crazy but you know at least entertaining but yeah she brought us to the farm we met the other backpackers i was like cool the backpackers here okay awesome you know everything's normal i talked to them and they were like yeah you know there's a bunch of problems with no lean but everybody's getting paid and i was like okay cool okay this, this is good i'll, I'll take, take it. it yeah and uh, yeah no lean yeah, yeah. uh, ran this alpaca farm she had a drinking problem smoke problem Nolene loves saying no, which was, uh, you know, the famous Dolly Parton song, Jolene. So we did a little remake of that for Nolene. When she would say no to somebody, sometimes we'd break out into a little canon, like, <laughs> yeah. Nolene, 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 Nolene. <laughs> and so um, she'd uh, drink uh, whiskey every night, Jim Beam. She had this massive hi fi stereo uh, system that she would uh, blast from like uh, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Oh my god. Wait for Nolene to finish her uh, solo club night <laughs> every day of the week so that we could go to bed. <laughs> uh, 
So I, ended, I worked there for like uh, a month. Wait, what job did you get? So a lot, there was a lot of peach farms around. Mm -hmm. When I got to uh, Nolene's and I met all the backpackers, they asked me, uh, so uh, which farm is Nolene going to put you on? And uh, Nolene told me I was going to be on Mario's farm with Baptiste. And uh, as soon as I said that, everybody was like, ooh, Mario's farm. Ooh. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. uh, not another. Not, not, <laughs> not something like this again. <laughs> And they're like, yeah, Mars Farm is tough. There's not that many peaches, and it's paid. Yeah, I was paid by by bin. Very important. Oh, to, right, uh, right. So, so that's say. like per amount of fruit that you pick, and um, exactly, you know, they yeah. go in these big bins, and they call them bins. When I worked in apple farms, and it was like per bin as well. But when I worked in strawberry farms, it was per tray. <laughs> so, uh, do you remember like how many kilos it was? It was like 450 kilos. I think okay. for thirty three dollars, thirty dollars. Yeah, yeah. It was not yeah. well paid, right? But you, yeah. there was still potential to make money, and some mm -hmm. people did. It, it totally makes a difference too, like how good the trees are uh, doing. If there's not a lot of oh, yeah. fruit on the trees, because you're like moving your ladder, you have to move a tractor down the aisle. Like there's all these things to maneuver. Yeah. So the more fruit that's available, the more money you'll make. And some people made like, you know, $400 each a day, like if they were real beasts, you know? And so I asked the backpackers like, uh, like, why is it, why is it not as good? They were like, yeah, the, 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 the trees don't have a, as much fruit. Um, the rows aren't as long and it stings particularly much at uh, Mario's and I was like sorry wait what stings and they were like yeah like like acid like acid burning and I was like but the picking peaches and they're like yeah yeah picking peaches yeah well your peach fuzz by nature is uh itchy so when you pick a, a peach off of a tree when it, the peach fuzz would just go all over the place and land on your skin and that would itch you know mm-hmm Mm -hmm. But uh, Mario put so uh, much pesticides on it. After like after about an hour, you start feeling a bit itchy, and then after three to four hours, you felt like your skin was burning. Oh my god! I'm talking like nasty, just nasty burn. Yeah, you know? yeah. It was so uncomfortable, like you're chafing all over the place. Oh, really that's bad. horrible! <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was, it was so bad. So I did a day there, and then we got back. I took a shower, and apparently when you take a shower, it's when it's at its worst. So this is some of the most painful showers I've ever taken oh because it's like the feeling you've had all day but times 10, mm. and then it goes away once you wash it all off, but it's like it's pretty nasty, and I was kind of getting worried for my health. Obviously not good. Yeah. And um, so after taking my shower, I went over to Nolene, and I pleaded to Nolene. I was like, there were new backpackers that just arrived as well, mm, yeah. just after us. And I was like, no, Link, please give him the Mario job. Like, we need Joe. Like, we're struggling so hard right now. We can't handle the pesticides. We're having a bad reaction mm -hmm, to it. You mm -hmm. know, it's really bad. Like, I, And Nolene was like, no, you don't deserve it yet. La, 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 you have to earn your way. And I was like, no, Lean, please, 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 come on, please do this for me. And she she loved that I groveled. <laughs> right? you know, she loved it. She really ate it up. And she was like, all right, then, you know. <laughs> And I was like, no way. Like, yeah. She just wanted me to grovel. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't even like you, she was making it out as to be like impossible for us to go to Joe's. But then I, I just had to you know, get on my knees and it was all fine. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, and so then the two other poor backpackers went to Mario's <laughs> and I kind of felt bad for them. But I was like, hey, no way. <laughs> yeah. Not the luck I have. They, ro they rocked up in a car and everything and I didn't have a car. So I was like, oh, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. So that's the real struggle as well. When you don't have a car in Australia, mm -hmm. you're really, you know, uh, you're really at the whim of your employer. You yeah, know, you you're at the mercy. You don't have that much negotiation room because they know that you don't have a car. So they know, they're know they like, where are you going to go, buddy? <laughs> yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. You know, I've heard about a lot of different fruits and how difficult they are to pick. And some of them, like you just never would have thought of it. So like apparently the sap from mangoes, when it gets on your skin, like uh, it'll burn you because the sun reacts with the sun somehow and it'll burn you so you have to wear like these full-on suits that cover your face and like arms and everything yeah. and it's super hot and humid in the north where they grow mangoes you know there's just all kinds of things like that that you never think about when you're getting your fruit at the grocery store and um for me at least it really opened my eyes to 
the the labor yeah. involved in in picking food and Shit, like it's hard. Um, but anyway, let's get back to your <laughs> your yeah. uh, experience. So okay, so you got the the job, and so we only spent one day in Mario's farm, and then uh, we went to Joe's, and uh, I spent the next three weeks picking for Joe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and over there, you know, they still used pretty much the same pesticides. It's, it would still burn, but not as much. Uh, so I uh, wore long sleeves, uh, gloves, mm-hmm. uh, like face, yeah. uh, head covering, and stuff. Also to protect from the sun because it was uh, towards the end of su- the end of summer at that time. So it was still, and plus mm-hmm. the water over there was not good either. Like the uh, local water supply was infected with some sort of uh, spore. Uh, that would make oh my you God. terribly sick. And uh, <laughs> since we didn't have a vehicle, uh, we sometimes ran out of uh, bottles of water. And so we had to drink yeah. the tap water sometimes. And it made us like very oh. sick and slow. And, oh, no. and so we had to deal with that as well. As much as my experiences in the countryside were, you know, touch and go. I mean, it was pretty idyllic where we were. It was beautiful. Um, yeah. But it sounds like you really <laughs> didn't have the best luck in the first uh, few months, which which totally happens yeah. to a lot of people. You know, some people get amazing gigs, like, and uh, and some people uh, really struggle, and um, and that's kind of the name yeah. of the game. But anyway, so you ended up ha- leaving the the farm then because yeah, after a while, I was like, well, I'm not making enough money, and also, you know, no leaving was saying that she wasn't taking uh skimming uh anything off our wages but uh we found mm-hmm. out later on that that was the case but yeah it Damn. was also like i, I kind of felt attached to the place you know i wasn't making enough money because there was a good community of backpackers over there but they all were talking yeah. about leaving soon so i was like okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna leave soon yeah. this is when me and batiste parted ways uh i was okay. working with batiste and batiste was really not happy and uh i'd met this guy and i was like i got this immediate vibe off the guy that he was just full of shit you know i was like yeah i just got this uh new opportunity i'm gonna go pick ginger you know this uh two hours away from here and these uh people can host us etc and batiste was like oh let's go with him and i was like no i don't i'm not getting a good vibe and he was telling me no but he's great etc and a week goes by and batiste is like yeah i'm gonna go work with him do you want to come with me and i was like nah yeah, I'm not feeling it. And I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. So we parted ways. Then like a month later, we talk on the phone. And uh, it turns out the guy was a total weirdo. He had lied about loads of shit. Oh, like, no. uh, I won't go into details, but he had a bad time. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. <laughs> and Poor uh, Baptiste. Yeah, poor Baptiste. I, I fell for him. But then after that, he left and he got a really good gig after that. He actually, mm. he told me he just left and he was walking in the middle of nowhere on this road. <laughs> trying to get picked up nobody would pick him up and it was starting to the you know the the night was starting to to come and it was starting to get really cold and you know he was thinking like shit i'm gonna sleep with the snakes <laughs> like you know oh, no. <laughs> and uh this lady picked him up and was like what the hell are you doing you know you could die out here like you, you don't <laughs> just oh do God. this <laughs> and she was like you're in luck i need a gardener <laughs> okay and uh <laughs> So he ended up living at this uh, lady's house, uh, working for her and also like gardening at her friend's place and stuff and like making a bit of money and you know, he was living nice. comfortably and he was meeting people. It was cool. It worked out for him. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a good success story. You just got to keep at it. You know, part of the reason why I really wanted to uh, have you on the, the podcast, because I find this such a unique working experience that you ended up landing on and uh and so you ended up working in a in a dairy farm oh, uh, yeah. which is hilarious to me because uh I'm your sister and you like as a kid growing up you were super sensitive to like smells and yeah, I just no, couldn't yeah. imagine I just could not imagine awesome. like when mom told me you were working on a dairy farm I was like <laughs> are you serious <laughs> yeah um so let's talk about that. Let's. Uh, you had two dairy farm jobs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had two dairy farms. Okay, so while I was uh, still at No Leans, I was uh, putting up ads on Gumtree, advertising myself as a tractor driver, and I had mm-hmm. five days of experience. So I was like, "Well, I'm a, I'm a fudge a bit on that. I'm going to say I have six months experience." <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, six months as experience one driving this 1980s Ford. Uh, okay. I get the the job offer and uh, he's like, yeah, can you be there in a week? So I'm like, oh, okay, I, I have a week's time. And my friend Renke, who I met at No Leans, was about to take his van to do a tour of the Great Ocean Road in his, uh, mm-hmm. in his van. 
And uh, he had asked me previously if I wanted to come with him. And uh, then all of a sudden this came along and I was like, great, I have a week. Do you want to do a week, uh, you know, uh, doing the Great Ocean Road? And uh, can you drop me off at this spot so that I can then take the bus to go back to Cobram? And he was like, mm -hmm. yeah, sure. So we did that. And that was really awesome. We stayed at free campsites and we met loads of backpackers, just bonfires every night, mm -hmm. uh, drinking goon as we always did. Um, going yeah. to like secluded beaches, spending the day there. It was really, it was really cool. Um, yeah, Australia is amazing for camping. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's amazing. And it's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. Great Ocean Road especially was beautiful. I mean, we went to these hidden waterfalls. They were, they were stunning. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah, and uh, so after that, you know, he dropped me off at the bus stop and uh, took the bus up to Cobram again. I got back to Cobram. I always seem to leave Cobram and come back. <laughs> 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 it's really like fucking hell when this place gonna leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. And uh, then I got to Cobram and uh, the farmer's wife uh, picked me up in Cobram. But I didn't put my age on my profile, right? Because right. nobody wants to hire an 18 year old. Yeah, and I could yeah. tell that she was, she was much more like upbeat on the phone. And then when I hung up and I just walked towards her because we were in the same parking lot, I can see a bit yeah. of disappointment. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> uh, I get to the farm and they're like, okay, you know, whatever, um, uh, you know, let's make this work. And so they invite me into their house and they were living in absolute squalor as really? well. Oh and my yeah, God. I mean, it was like dirty dishes everywhere. Just nothing had its place. It was, there was newspaper on the ground. It was like really bad. And then they take me to the, um, to my accommodation where I'm going to be staying. And there was two Dutch guys working for them at the time. And uh, one of the Dutch guys would uh, come uh, come to be uh, yeah, a good friend. The other mm -hmm. guy just it revealed himself as this crazy psycho. <laughs> some okay. some point down the line. So and uh, yeah, I was paid eight hundred uh, dollars a week, accommodation included as well, which was really good. Yeah. Oh, so that's was, great. Yeah. Yeah, I was saving a lot of money there. So I had previously driven like a nineteen eighties uh, Ford Tractor, which was like you know very straightforward. You know. Not that much tech in there, so you didn't have to know much. And he put me in this massive tractor that was like twice mm -hmm. the size and uh, had all these buttons all over the place. Everything was automated and it was just, it was, it was not user friendly at all. <laughs> and uh, the, the farmer, I could barely understand him. He had such a thick accent and he would say everything really fast and he would mumble a lot. And he was very impatient as well. Like I could ask him to repeat something once, but then the second time he would get really irritated with me and like, cuss at me and stuff <laughs> so uh, yeah real character real character and uh so he gets me into the tractor and you know i'm so confused because he's throwing all this information at me and then he tells me where i'm supposed to go and i'm not even sure where i'm supposed to go and the farm is huge so i was like jesus christ am i gonna go like till the wrong field or something you know like a seeded field am i just gonna yeah. go rip all the seeds out by accident like, jesus. oh my god and um so he put me in this massive tractor with this massive trimming mod on the back. It was huge. That kind of went off to one side. And as I go mm -hmm. to go through the first gate, and then all of a sudden a big yeah. bang. And since the, the mod naturally kind of goes to the left, it swung into the post. And I dented his very expensive uh, topping machine. Oh, and shit. so he, you know, he gets super pissed at me. He's like, you don't know how to drive. I can tell, la, la, la. you know, you lied. He said, and I'm like, no, I didn't lie, but I actually did. But I didn't tell him yeah. that. I was like, this is just really hard, you know. And to be honest, I could have figured it out if I wasn't so stressed out. And he just stressed me out so much. Uh, right, because right. later on, he would uh, put me into the tractor again. And I would, uh, I, I managed to do the job correctly. Uh, but I just lacked so much confidence that, you know, it didn't go well. And uh, so then he was like, well, screw you. I'm putting you in the dairy, you know? And I was like, shit. I know that means that I'm going to have to wake up at 3.30. I'm going to have to milk 130 some cows every morning <laughs> and then every evening. Uh, oh my God. And I was like, oh shit. Okay, well, you know, let's see what it's about. And uh, I was working with Evo, which was the other uh, Dutch dude that I was working with. And uh, mm -hmm. he was kind of OCD type. He was really like, he, you right. could tell he would take a pleasure in, you know, like micromanaging you and kind of being the, the all authority and stuff. <laughs> and I kind of pandered to that because I could tell that he liked it. The first day in the dairy farm was, um, uh, man, it was, uh, it was rough. Um, like well, I was in a herringbone dairy. So you have a row of cows on each side and it really never stops. As soon as basically you fill up one row, 
you start milking the cows. And then while you're milking the cows, while the cups are on the cow's teats, because basically you put these suction cups on the cow's teats and then that milks them. So as we were milking one row, we'd bring in the next row. And it was like that for like three and a half hours nonstop. Just the, that's just the milking. And then mm. there's the whole setting up, which takes like 45 minutes. And then the cleanup, which takes like an hour, not to an hour and a half. And when you're milking and the two places that I milked that, uh, you are positioned. And I think this is, this is just how you milk a cow in general. Uh, you milk it mm-hmm. from behind. You don't milk it from the side mm-hmm. because if you milk it from the side, it can kick you because cows kick, uh, right. like to the side, you know? Yeah. And, uh, so if you're right behind it, i.e. right under its butthole, (laughs) then, you know, you're fine, (laughs) you know, as far as kicking goes. Uh, But then that introduces another problem, which is, you know, you get shat on and pissed on, like, (laughs) daily. Um, After a while, you develop kind of a sixth sixth sense for it. You know, you can kind of feel it coming on. And, like, towards, like, the, I don't know, after, like, a month or so, I was just, like, naturally dodging shit like I was doing in the Matrix. It was really cool. Um, That's so funny. How did you, this affect how you felt about the whole process? uh, So, you know, like, the cows over there were not well treated in that farm like the the own like the mm-hmm. the the farmer would uh when a cow misbehaved in the dairy he would beat the cow oh, wow. and he would beat it with a metal rod uh yeah that's pretty horrible. which was really rough um and you know i would think that would put me off milk uh and anything associated with it but i was in a situation where i was having such a hard time as well that I didn't even think too deeply about it because I was suffering too. And I had my suffering to, to kind of address, right. you know? And when I could, when I found out that he was doing that to the cows, I was just so overwhelmed already that I didn't even know how to process it. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't even know. It's like, should yeah. I, I was like, should I report this? Should I not? I don't, I don't know what to do, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. later on down the line, they, he dehorned a cow without any anesthetic, which is illegal. So, uh, you know, cows naturally have horns, uh, all cows, mm-hmm. but, um, mm-hmm. when we see them, they're dehorned yeah. because, uh, it's a, it's a safety measure. They say basically, mm-hmm. um, when they have horns, they can injure themselves and, uh, they start fights and they can poke holes and et cetera. Now, you know, they say it's for the safety of the cow, but that's not necessarily true because they're putting them in the conf- these very confined spaces in the first place where, you know, it's conducive to them being aggressive with one another. So, mm-hmm. um, but if they gave them enough space in the first place, then they wouldn't be fighting all the time. So they wouldn't be right. in need for that. Uh, and so you witnessed this dehorning yeah this dehorning without anesthetic and uh, marius my buddy marius filmed it and then sent it sent it to the australian um was it PETA? australian PETA. yeah PETA is the um the most famous uh, animal rights activist group so yeah. yeah so the australian version of that basically okay interesting. Uh, he sent it over to them with some information so that was that was good uh but i uh, lost contact with marius uh, shortly mm. after that so um, who knows where that went but what but, was that uh, yeah. like what was the dehorning like it was gruesome we uh so he took these massive uh which looked like it kind of looked like garden shears but it had like a guillotine system at the end mm-hmm. and he would slip that onto the horn Ugh. at its root and chop it off no and Ugh. there are a lot of nerve endings there Oh gosh! So it hurts a lot. It's like cutting off, like it's like ripping out a tooth. You know what I mean? And I was just like, I was just like, this is so depressing. It's just yeah. so sad. Yeah. And actually, one of the things about a f- uh, that I like to point uh, that I like to touch on about farms is that there's usually a farm dog, and mm. even when the people there are nasty to you, the dog will always be sweet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I remember after seeing that uh, bull being dehorned, I was I was pretty I was kind of like just sad. So I just mm-hmm. went over to uh, one of the husky type dogs that they had, Monty, and uh, just spent like ten minutes my ten minute break with Monty, and I felt a bit better. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. You know? But so uh, talk ab- about, let's tell a few more stories about your time working in the dairy farm. You don't need to... There was this one situation where I was put into the tractor to uh, shovel out like about 10 tons of shit from this ditch. <laughs> um, and it, I actually got like lightheaded from the shit. <laughs> <laughs> from I the fumes? There, like, fermenting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I was like weird and... Poisoning is yeah, and I was driving thing. This- <laughs> Uh, also like one of the challenging things was, uh, when you had to clean the dairy, you had to, uh, hose down the yard with this massive hose Mm -hmm. and there were flies everywhere. And when you would, uh, hit the shit with your hose, the flies would go up in the, in the air and just (laughs) swarm to your face. I tried taking a picture once, but I couldn't because I was just like, you know, this is just covered in shit and my tactile screen couldn't work. So <laughs> Your touch uh, screen wouldn't work because you had shit yeah, your fingers. <laughs> exactly. So I couldn't take a picture oh, of it, so but it was there were, there were probably like a couple a hundred of flies, hundreds of flies. I had a fly yeah. mask. Like there was right. more, you could see more fly than skin on my face. Yeah. And they yeah. particularly liked what was around your eyes and nose. Yeah. And so they would kind of like feed on that, you know, so they were just like <laughs> yeah. eating off your eye gunk and stuff. It was just all nasty, you know, nasty, nasty, yeah. nasty stuff. Um, and I had to do that like twice a day and I was the rookie. So I was, uh, you know, I did that a lot for the first two weeks. Um, yeah. And uh, one, of the, one of the fun parts of the job was uh, driving the quad and rounding up the cows to bring them into the dairy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would uh, usually take uh, Toby, which was uh, farmer's daughter's dog. And we worked with the farmer's daughter in the dairy, and she was absolutely horrible. She was just super mean and just not nice at all. Wow. And she really liked Evo. Everybody liked Evo so much. And it was, he was and Evo was such a dick. It was so weird. <laughs> and uh, I think it's because they were all dicks, so they just liked each other amongst, amongst assholes. Um, Evo is the other backpacker, right? The, yeah, but but one. Marius, Marius like knew that Evo was crazy and everybody else was crazy. So me and Marius, right. we got we got pretty close. Like he was so, you had a cool, friend. Cool yeah, guy. that's good. Yeah. So Toby, yeah, Toby was tiny. He was like really, he was a really small dog. <laughs> uh, you know, I would uh, fire up the tractor and around two, and he'd always know around two that I was that somebody was doing it. So he'd hop on the tractor. You know, we'd drive down like five minutes to the field, and then get to the field where all the cows were, and he'd hop off. And start barking at the cows. They were like, you know, like huge beasts. Like, I look like they weigh a ton, those things. And massive, massive Fraser cows, the Dutch cows. So they're black and white, really big ones. And yeah, so uh, Toby was just barking at all these cows and really, you know, making them haul ass. It was great to see. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you have like a herding cow mishap? Oh, uh, yeah, something? that wasn't, oh, that wasn't even herding. That was, that was really my fault. Yeah, so I was in charge for the fir- for like first two weeks to feed the calves. And uh, what I'd have to do is take the milk of the cows that I'd just given birth, put a, that milk in a separate vat, and then that milk I would I would use to fill up this uh, big blue machine that, that had a big tank in the middle and that had a bunch of teats going around it in a circle, a bunch of plastic teats. And so you could attach that behind the quad. And so uh, I filled mm-hmm. it up with milk, attached it behind the quad, and I drove the quad into the field, uh, closed the gate behind me, and turn the taps on, let the milk flow, and the cows, little calves were eating. Uh, it was all very cute, very nice, and I was having a good time. I think I was filming as well at the same time. I was like, oh, <laughs> And, um, <laughs> you know, I started thinking about something else, and I must have gotten distracted or whatever. Uh, I turn off the taps, I um, uh, turn on the quad, and I start driving out. And then uh, I drive towards uh, my boss because I could see that he was, like, kind of waving at me. And I was like, oh, he was pretty far in the distance. And so I started uh, driving closer to him. And then I could see him trying to yell. And I was like, oh, he seems like he's something's urgent that's going on. And so I started accelerating faster, except that, you know, when you accelerate faster, you can't, you, you, you can hear even less because the quad's louder. As I got closer, I could start making out the words, you fucking idiot, you fucking idiot. And I quickly went through the things <laughs> on my mind where I could have fucked up. And I realized, like, oh shit, I didn't close the gate behind me on my way out. And I turned around and almost all the calves were outside of their their pen. A lot of them were starting to run towards the main road. And that main road was actually quite busy. 
And I could just see myself like, I'm like being responsible for the death of a bunch of calves because mm. I was an idiot and I didn't Aww. close the gate. So I quickly drifted the quad, went back and drove down the dirt road. And these calves were galloping because I was driving behind them. So I was scaring them. So they start really galloping, you know, really yeah. fast. And cows can run damn fast. The quad wasn't particularly fast. So I was like really like slowly like weaving through the through the calves and some of them were pretty big you know and yeah. i finally like got a bit ahead of them and then i got like 10 meters ahead of them and i was getting towards the end of the road and i was like oh my god it's now or never so i drift <laughs> to the side and uh, i almost flipped the quad which is very dangerous to do you don't want to flip a quad yeah get squashed and uh, i jumped off and I created like a barrier with uh, the quad and my body. And there was like quite a few big calves, like soon to be called cows. Right. That were like trying to challenge me and that, you know, were like scraping their, uh, uh, their feet on the floor and stuff like trying to like, you know, telling me like, I, I'm going to charge you. <laughs> yeah. I was like, no, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Um, and I ended up uh, rounding them back and they were all fine. So I was like, <laughs> So you were just like standing, like spread armed and legs, like yeah, hoping for the best. And if one of the calves would have gotten through, it would have ruined the whole thing. Because one right. goes, they all go. <laughs> That's cow mentality. That's so you. crazy! Oh my gosh! Yeah, it just goes to show, like, what a difficult job, you know? Like, it's just, it's tough, man. Like, you got to know your shit, and it's, yeah. it's just, I find it so funny that, like. And interesting that you can just kind of go out and get those jobs and it could lead a, an experienced 18 year old to um, be in charge of a herd of cattle, which is <laughs> just funny, man. Just really funny. Yeah. Um, also, I wanted to say like yeah, these people, the first dairy farm that I worked at, uh, I went through hell and back to get paid in the end because um, uh, I left without them. I left before they paid me for like a, a month, a month's mm -hmm. labor. Um, Whoa. And for they, and they owed me like 2,400 more Australian dollars. Oh my God. And they didn't want to pay me. And they said, yeah. and they were even, they even went, they even said like, oh, we paid you already. We're not going to pay. And I was like, no, you didn't pay me. That's ridiculous. I know I'm an idiot, but no, not that much of an idiot. <laughs> and uh, they were paying us off the books. They were mm -hmm. going to go into retirement. Uh, so I threatened to rat them out to the, uh, the tax authorities. And I knew that that worked because I really got a reaction from the guy that he started swearing at me at the top of his lungs through the phone. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it now. And he was like, no, 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 no. And uh, I was like, okay, you paying me? He was like, yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah, pay me today. Damn. And he paid me all the money that he owed me. I was like, victory. That felt yeah. like such a victory. I was like, you know, not only, uh, this is my 18 year old awkward self, you know, it was kind of hard to speak to an adult like that, you know, that I had totally. worked for and it was kind of intimidating and shit. And I just, you know, I held my ground and he paid me the money that he owed me. You learn from your mistakes and, and, uh, and hopefully some people are learning from your mistakes right now. Uh, don't leave yeah. before getting yeah. paid. Please learn from my mistakes. Yes. Anyway, so then uh, I got a job at another place, and uh, I started working for um, uh, this, uh, this 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 nice married couple. They had kids, and the the kids were were nice as well. And uh, they had a big operation. There was like one thousand two hundred cows uh, that to be milked in the morning and then in the evening. Um, and I was hired as a milker because I had good experience. I was like, I'm not going to try and fake it till I make it as a tractor driver anymore. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can, I can do another two months of dairy farming and then I'll, um, I'll uh, take the money I'll save and I'll have a good time. And so they were paying me $23 an hour, which was really good. And I was doing uh, 12 to 13 hour days. Damn. Uh, so I was making a lot of money there, except yes, that I had the, the, the hardest job there because uh, I was the least desirable person. Same thing happened again. I didn't tell them my age. I arrived there and they realized I was 18. They were very disappointed. Mm. Um, and uh, so they put me on cups on, which is uh, I was working in a rotary dairy where you have three different positions. The cows were spinning on this big kind of uh, circular platform. And then when they reached me, they were already uh, um, cleaned and sanitized. So I would put the cups on which were these metallic suction cups, which were made out of metal. So when I worked there, it was winter. So they were absolutely freezing in the morning. You touch them. It was like touching liquid nitrogen and like mm -hmm. burn your fingers off. It was so oh cold. My God. 
but eventually I got used to it and I didn't couldn't feel it anymore. And I would just put the cups on. So I was putting cups on for like uh, a thousand and some cows uh, every morning and then every evening again. Uh, and it was mind numbing work because it was chain chain production. I was just uh, doing the same thing over and over again. And I wasn't even doing my job properly because I had to check for mastitis every time that, um, so every time you put the cups on for, uh, before putting on the cups, I had to take a, um, a uh, cloth and squeeze a bit of milk out of the teeth of the cow and check the napkin to see if there are any clumps. And if there okay. are clumps on the napkin, it means that the cow might have mastitis or, and this is a massive problem, especially uh, on these dairy farms because, uh, you know, these cows are, are designed pretty much to produce as much milk as possible. And mastitis occurs when you don't milk a cow enough. So this is a very important thing to check constantly. And mm -hmm. the wife um, of the farmer, well, the, sorry, not the wife of the farmer, she was also running the farm. She was on cups off, so she was at the last station. So she could see me through the feet of the cow on the other side of the dairy. And she was checking on me to make sure that I was checking for mastitis. And she mm -hmm. caught me out numerous times not checking. And <laughs> she would always come back to me and yell and say, you're doing your job terribly, you're hurting the cows, blah, blah, blah. and I would always say, I'm so sorry, this is just very overwhelming for me, I promise I'll do a better job, please don't fire me, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and uh, she that happened like three, four times, and she was really getting on my case, you know, she was really yelling at me, like, I was like, fuck, she hates me, but uh, then after that, I started doing my job properly, and we didn't have any more problems, and uh, right. I worked there for like two months, and then at the end, I was like, I was completely burnt out. I was living in a house where everybody was in a couple. So everybody was doing a couple thing, kind of, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was like alone most of the time, even during on my free time. So I was starting to really lose my shit. And I was calling home a lot. I was feeling very homesick. Yeah, and so I decided nice. after two months, I was like, you know what? I've been here for like six months. I have worked hard. I want to go to the south of France and see my friends and spend all the money I just made. Mm -hmm. you know. So, so how much money did you leave with? Yeah, so I think I left with uh, about eight thousand Australian dollars, something like that. Which I was and pretty proud of. That's not too bad for like, yeah, that's not too bad for like how much you you struggled. Like, yeah, definitely. I mean, I really hustled for that for that seven grand. Yeah, or so. I mean, that's um, what it's about, though. It's it's the hustle and it's the experience that you have at the same time. Because you know, even if it was maybe a little bit hard at times i mean clearly you learned so much and had like some amazing memories oh yeah definitely um and definitely built up my self-confidence as well i was like i went out there to make money and to see a bit of australia as well I, I went out there to kind of prove myself to myself you know to you know i'd never had a job before i kind of you know mm -hmm. um felt a bit spoiled and i think you know <laughs> and uh i i felt like you know i'm getting older I don't know. I, I want to be able to take myself seriously. So I want to go do something hard and risky. And um, yeah, one thing I want to uh, talk about, uh, just uh, finish on about my last experience at the farm. When I told the boss that I was going to quit and he told Claire, his wife, Claire came up to me and she was like, I'm sorry, I was tough on you. I, you know, I think you're a good kid. Um, mm -hmm. I, I never come across a backpacker that was as honest with me as you were. When, when I tell people that they're messing up, they usually lie to me and I know that they're lying mm. to me, but when I told mm -hmm. you that you were messing up, you owned up to it and you mm -hmm. try to do a better job. And, uh, that's very rare around here. She told me that and then she gave me a hug and I was like, oh my God, I thought this lady hated me. <laughs> And, you know, and I thought the whole way through, I was like, I'm going to do this honestly. I'm not going to try and cheat because people know when you cheat, you know. And um, I felt like for a while I was being honest and I was doing all these things. I was being good hearted, but I was just being, you know, kicked down every time. And towards the end, she revealed to me that actually, no, it was a great quality of yours. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't show it to you more. And I was like, oh, she gave me a hug. And then she wrote me a, a handwritten letter. Um, saying pretty much the same thing, and I still have that letter today. I don't know, I felt like I had received the moral to the poem that was uh, my adventure in Australia.
And if you want to learn more about Shandor's journey and how to apply for a working holiday visa, you can visit our website at www.gtspodcast.com, where we'll feature a cool blog about how to avoid Shandor's mistakes so you don't repeat the same. <laughs> Find us on Instagram at Globe Trotters Podcast. That's one word, Globe Trotters Podcast. On Twitter, we're at Globe Trot Pod. And we have a Facebook page at Globe Trotters Podcast. And on the next episode, we feature Max's friend, John Petrino, who went from zero camping experience to living in a camping van before it was a trend and guiding tours all over the United States, some of which resulted in relatively dangerous situations that John is lucky to have made it out okay. Music on this episode is by Thin Blue Collective. Shondor actually plays with Thin Blue Collective live, uh, so that's kind of a cool f- full circle moment. Editing on this episode is by yours truly, myself, me, Saskia, and mixing is by Gregory Friedel. Thanks for joining us on this leg of the journey, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>